Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's program um, that is uh, featured about the history of the Library of Michigan. We're celebrating the 195th uh, anniversary of the State Library. As you can see, things are a little bit different than how we normally have been doing uh, presentations in the past. Uh, one, you're not just seeing me or, or my colleague, Matt Pacer. Uh, instead, we now have a panel that we're going to be doing a, a discussion about the history of the library um, with a couple of colleagues. So for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, I'm Adam Oster. I'm the Community Engagement Librarian of the Library of Michigan, and I will let my two uh, colleagues sitting next to me uh, introduce themselves. Let's start with Bernie. Why don't you tell everybody who you are and, and what you do related to the library? Uh, my name is Bernadette Bartlett, and my official title is the Michigan Documents Librarian. What that means is that I'm responsible for preserving the um, publications that are released by state government agencies. And as a result of doing that work, it's it's one of our oldest and deepest collections of um, information about Michigan. And the library's history was also buried in that collection. And so, when I discovered that, it just it lit a fire in me, and it's just something that's fascinated me ever since. And then next to Bernie uh, is somebody who does not work for the Library of Michigan. However, we still consider her a friend of the library. <laughs> Valerie, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Valerie Marvin. I'm the historian curator at the Michigan State Capitol. My coworkers refer to this as my second office, if you will, because I spend a lot of time over here using those state documents that Bernie was talking about and also um, using microfilm and really trying to plumb the depths of the collection to better understand the Capitol building. What has happened in it over the years? What is the evolution of the building itself? And who are the people who've worked in the building? And what have they done to contribute both to state government, but also to Michigan history across the state? Um, many people touch the Capitol in different ways particularly uh, through the legislature, through different elected offices, through the different departments that used to be in the building. And so I am always here trying to dig through resources to learn more about our three Capitol buildings and about the people who have worked in them over the years. So we're going to be spending uh, the uh, time that we have together this evening talking about the origins and history of the library. Um, I just want to ask that everybody who is participating, please keep yourself muted. Um, we will be taking questions at the end. If you do put any questions in the chat, that is where we will um, we'll be holding on to those and then asking them uh, at the, or answering them at the end um, once we get done talking. So we should be going probably about 45 minutes to an hour. We might go longer depending on how much <laughs> the panel has as far as conversation. Um, and uh, if you are interested in future programs uh, with the Library of Michigan, you can go to michigan.gov slash LM public programs. Um, since we also have a representative capital here, I would also encourage you to check out the various in-person and virtual programs that they have. Um, so I think we should go ahead and get started as far as our, our discussion. So um, I'm going to kick this question first to Bernie and uh, ask, why don't you um, describe the origins of the Library of Michigan? What was its initial purpose? Um, how did it serve Michigan's government at the time when it was first created? The library actually had its origins with the establishment of the Territorial Council in 1824. As soon as that group of um, men began uh, meeting and developing Michigan law, they started accumulating materials, but it's not until 1828 that they actually decide we need to establish a library. So the Territorial Library was established, and then they also created a Territorial Librarian position. Um, this library primarily served, again, territorial state government. It was legislators, it was the governor, his other executive um, officers at the time, Secretary of State, um, and then the judges as well. And it primarily is composed of legal materials from other states, from the federal government, and even other countries. There's um, over time some minimal reference work that works that are added. So 
If somebody donated a dictionary, there might be a dictionary there. Um, but it was primarily about the law. And the reason for that is that the men that were in the legislative council, they were educated men. Some of them were um, trained uh, attorneys, but some of them were not. So they didn't have a background in the law and they didn't want to reinvent the wheel as far as creating Michigan law. So they started with works that had been, or laws that had been passed in other, with other governments. Um, they, you also have to think about efficiency. They did not have access to the transportation and the information sharing technology that we have today. It took a lot of time to figure this stuff out. And these people, they only met for a few months at a time, sometimes only once, maybe twice a year. And so they, the work that they were doing um, was focused really on just legal materials. Um, the librarian that was um, appointed, that position required no specific uh, training or background. Again, it was uh, an educated person. Um, but they did not do things that libraries or librarians would be acquainted with today. So we talk about collection development, which is figuring out what materials to purchase and um, how to organize them in the library. And these librarians didn't do anything like that. Um, and in fact, they had um, what we often term other duties as a sign. And so if needed, they would perform carpentry. They were responsible for sweeping the floors outside of the um, uh, legislative chambers. And um, they, the librarian was paid a salary, but appropriations for the library were hit or miss. So sometimes there was money to purchase materials, which was not easy to do because again, we didn't have catalogs, we didn't have Amazon, nothing like that. Um, but there was, sometimes there weren't appropriations or those appropriations were, were sucked back into some other government function. And then what I've also found is that at the time, government officials, sometimes they felt that if I don't spend this money, I will be looked on with favor and maybe I can get another state government position. So the library in these very early um, territorial and early statehood years um, did not function the way it does now, although its purpose was the same. So it sounds like the librarian probably would have been the webmaster for the entire state government <laughs> if they had a website <laughs> at that time. And I believe you, you've, you've learned before how many items were in their collection at the beginning. Um, in 1828, there was, I think, 131 volumes. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the actual list of titles is like less than 20 yeah. because these were like series of, of volumes of yeah. laws. And um, there was some, a census, a federal census yeah. in there, but yeah. that was about it. Well, and that's something important to think about in terms of space is early on, the library is not a building. The library is not a room. The library is just possibly a couple of shelves of books, mm -hmm. quite frankly. Yeah. So it's not a library as we would think of it today. Yeah. It is a collection of books. Yeah, because we had up a, a picture of the first Capitol building mm -hmm. and, you know, this, as you said, would only be taking up a small right. space. And and to be frank, we don't know as much about the interior of that first capital as we would like to. Um, we don't have good floor plans. We have a few descriptions from people writing long after. Mm -hmm. We also don't have any pictures of the interior, or at least known pictures. If you have any, I expect to be your first protocol tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, and it is quite possible that some of the books just kind of floated through the building based on who was using them, who was responsible for certain things. The Supreme Court probably would have wanted different things when they were around versus some of the other state officials. And the state librarians themselves early on were sometimes tied to other departments or other state officers. Mm -hmm. So for example, we know in the 1850s by law, 
the state librarian was also kind of the assistant to the superintendent of public instruction, which is the 19th century version of the state superintendent of education today. And so you see people coming into the library sometimes through education, mm -hmm. which makes sense to us. And Michigan, of course, has a, a very rich early history of public education. Um, we're the first state to have a state superintendent in our constitution. Mm -hmm. But there's also this, this attempt early on to create a network of libraries across the state along the common schools and that goes nowhere quite frankly <laughs> it's discussed in state documents mm -hmm. the state never has the power to really get it up and going so there was a, a sense that these two things kind of belong together but they weren't big enough and strong enough to actually forge those those bonds mm -hmm. but to me it makes perfect sense that the library comes into being at the same time the first capital is being built. Yeah. The first building that we had as a capital was actually built in the territorial period. So 1823 to 1828, not because it took five years to build, because it took five years to afford. And once we have that building, that's where most of state government operates out of. And state government is extremely small. Michigan is extremely small. It will take us many decades before we hit even a million people in the state. So we're talking a few hundred thousand is all. And when you think about travel, as Bernie said, moving people, moving information was so difficult. And having the capital in Detroit, on one hand, it made sense because Detroit was then, as it is now, our biggest city. But on the other hand, to get legislators to that capital in Detroit, you know, some of them are having to travel literally for weeks. There are no roads in much of Michigan. You are sometimes walking from point A to point B to attempt to make it to that capital. And so you think about that, you know, how desperate some of these people would have been for that information when they came. Mm -hmm. For many people, even a hundred and some books would have been the best library they had access to. Yeah. And that's something that I always find fascinating is if you look at the old catalogs of the library, and they're small. This is one I grabbed a few minutes ago. This is 1857, not a thick book. Um, that is the information that they have that they are governing via. Mm -hmm. And to me, the library has always been a real mm -hmm. source of power in government, maybe indirect power, but it's that information that the librarian, that the library is pulling together that forms the basis for what government is going to do. <laughs> well, and then you, you you talk about the location being in Detroit. Eventually, the capital does transition from Detroit to Lansing, and you know we we then bring the capital there. Do we know much more about what the environment of the library was like once it transitioned from Detroit to Lansing, or is this still another moment where we're like? If there are images or descriptions out there, please tell Val and Bernie <laughs> as soon as possible. It gets slightly better documented, but arguably the conditions actually get worse in terms of the physical conditions because you're now coming up to Lansing or Lansing Township as it was originally. You are working in a wooden building that you'll see on your screen. A wooden building. This is an era when we are heating and lighting everything using open flame. Do you want every important state document down to the Constitution? Do you want every single publication the state has in a wooden building? On the second floor of a wooden building, find you, not our finest choice, probably. You can see in the old reports where there are different books in different rooms sometimes. There were books in crates in the basement, which this is a Michigan basement. So we're talking water issues, mold issues. Um, I've seen things that suggest there were times they just went down to the basement and were like, oh, well, this one's destroyed, pitch that box. Yeah. Um, it, the physical conditions were awful. And the truth is, yes, that was very important for the library. And as book people, we all go, <laughs> but it was that way for everybody in government. Yeah. This building was meant to be temporary. It was very small, very plain, and we just kind of kept living with it until we had money to do something else. And in part because of the Civil War, that money doesn't come along until the 1870s. And what's interesting is as we are having this conversation about, we need a new capital, we need a more permanent capital, we need a fireproof capital. One of the people who's leading that is a state librarian. His name is Jesse Tenney. He is arguably the first real full-time state librarian. He still has some duties related to the superintendent of public instruction early on, but he comes in in 1859. 
having been actually a school superintendent down at Marshall. And he comes in and he changes the library in many ways. But one of the things he is brave enough to do in his reports is he is brave enough to scold the legislature and the governor and say, if you want this institution to really grow, you need to give it a suitable home. That means a fireproof building. That also means a building that is big enough to make the collection accessible because books in boxes don't do anyone any good if they can't get to them. Now, Jesse will ultimately serve for 10 years um, and he will, professionalization is a complicated thing because library schools don't exist in this period, but he will turn the library into a professional, a professionally run respected entity within state government. And you can see he's able to do things that nobody else had been able to do at that point. He is able to get the state to insure the collection for the first time. He is able to get consistent appropriations, which if you've ever worked in government, you know how difficult that can be. He is also able to get the library set up as a repository for federal documents. It helps that one of our congressmen was also a former state librarian, mm -hmm. but he's also able to start seriously acquiring. So he, for example, spends time out East. He has to go to physically buy books. And he is able to do that. So he really starts to grow the collection. And it happens in fits and starts. One of the big things that they're doing by this point in time is document exchanges with other states. The states would send basically uh, similar reports back and forth. So gubernatorial speeches, legislative journals, PAs, reports from commission of this and that. Well, a lot of those had been interrupted with the Southern states during the Civil War. And Jesse grouses about it in his reports. He was very much a unionist. But then as soon as the war is over, he says, okay, you're back in. We need your reports. Mm -hmm. And here's ours. Because he understands that good government in Michigan doesn't have to come from nowhere. We can and should be looking at what other governments are doing and using that information to inform what we are doing as we govern the state. Mm -hmm. So... Do you want to add anything to yeah, that? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to say anything because the, uh, and the exchange system that you talked about was really significant to the yeah. library because it was one way that the library grew that didn't actually require any appropriations. Yes. Yeah. That was a free exchange between states and other governments. And um because again, we could not access other states' information the way we can today. So we had to have copies of Wisconsin's and Massachusetts and New York's materials so that somebody could use them here. So that was a really significant program. And you can see instances in the Michigan library's history where they are using those resources from other states and answering, quite frankly, legal questions that other people in government have, including the governor. So it's really interesting to see how those documents help inform serious decision making all well, the way up to the state. It, it also shows the the, the close-knitness that um, when they're having those questions, yeah. you're being able to go right to the librarian, yes. whether it's the governor or other members of the legislature or you know, it, it's so much different than what it is today, where one is in one building, one is in another, and we don't really walk past each other right, in the right. hallways. Right. Um, building on, you know, with Jesse Tenney, um, it's important to then show in how in 1869 that there was an even more significant change to the library with the appointment of Harriet Tenney. Um, Val, as far as the impact of her appointment, her connection with Jesse Tenney, um, how, how did all of that change the role of the library with her tenure? Sure. So Harriet came to the library unofficially with Jesse in 1859. There was a well-established, quiet expectation that men who worked in state government would have other family members who would be willing to help out on occasion. Um, most family members received no compensation for this. There were no rules against, you know, bringing one's spouse, children, grandma, servant, whomever to work with you. It was just the way things operated. And so pretty much from day one, as Jesse is in the library, 
his wife Harriet is with him. They were an unusual couple. Um, they married in 1854 and came to Michigan soon after, and they always were both professionals. Um, and they made deliberate decisions to do this. They never had children. They never had a, a private home. They lived in boarding houses throughout much of their adulthood. Um, and Harriet finds, she finds her place in the library. And even though Jesse has the appointment, even though he is writing the reports and putting his name on the documents, you can see her in the shadows. For example, when he's doing those book buying trips, she is the one running the library because the library has to be open every day under state law. She is the person who is um, helping pull together resources. She is staffing the library when he is off working as a lawyer, which he did at the same time when he's serving on Lansing City Council, when he's giving political speeches around the country. So she's a known entity. What changes, though, in the 1860s is word starts to get around that after five terms, that these were two-year terms, everybody served a two-year term at this point, after five terms, word is circulating that Jesse's not going to be reappointed. And we don't completely know why. There could have been some health issues going on. There could have been politics. But we know in early 1869 that there are other people who have heard Jesse's not going to be reappointed and who are sort of, you know, circling and thinking, ooh, maybe, 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 maybe. And you have to remember, there is no technical qualification for any of these jobs. So a lot of the letters that people wrote to the governor that survived say things like, hi, Mr. Governor, I would like to be state librarian because I've always been a good party supporter. <laughs> I voted for you in the last election and convinced all of my friends to do the same thing, so you should give me a job. Well, several people do this sort of thing. And then in late March, Harriet writes a letter to the governor. Now, she does it on state library letterhead, which I love because that clearly says, look, I'm here. Yeah. But she's a woman. She is asking for something that no woman has ever had in Michigan. So she starts her letter, letter off by asking the governor if she should consider applying for the position. And then she, she spends the next two pages doing just that. She lists all of her qualifications. She talks about the fact that she has already worked in the library for 10 years. She knows the collection well. She names several people who are supporting her, including several sitting state, um, state officials. She talks about the fact that she can do the physical work and knows what it requires, despite the fact that she's a woman and perceived to be of the weaker sex. And she closes the letter by reminding the governor that just in case he doesn't know, by the way, there is a woman doing this already in Minnesota. Their librarian is a Mrs. Smith, and she does a very nice job. <laughs> Implication, you cannot tell me I can't have this job because I'm female. Within just a handful of days, Governor Baldwin appoints her, and she breaks new ground and is celebrated around the English-speaking world. It is such a big deal that there is now a woman serving as a state officer, because state librarians were state officers, which was like the equivalent of a department director today. There's a woman doing this work now. The fact that she's in a library almost matters less. There's a woman in government, and people start suggesting, maybe this shows that women have a place in government. Maybe women should be voting. Maybe women should be a more visible part of this process. And I would argue that as important as Harriet is to the library, and she will serve 22 years in her own right, she is appointed by governors of both sides of the political aisle, which again, if you've worked in government, that's not easy. Um, but more than anything else, she makes it possible, acceptable, and even considered to be um, a good thing that women are working in the Capitol. And you can see within just a few years of her appointment, women starting to get hired in, not just as, oh, you're here to help your husband, but you get a paycheck and you are paid at the same rate as your male colleagues in Michigan. And she celebrates this in her first report. So she was required, all state librarians were, every two years to basically explain what they've been doing and how they've been spending their money. This report survives in the joint documents. So this is one of those wonderful state documents from 1870 that Bernie gets to keep an eye on. It says, by the advice of the chief executive of the state and with the unanimous consent and approbation of the Senate on 31st day of March, 1869, this library was placed in charge of a woman, capital W, capital O, capital M, capital A, capital N. And the fact that she is even writing this, that she is now state documents are being authored by a woman, that's remarkable too. 
Michigan government now has, at least from its library, a female voice. And what I think is fascinating is as soon as she gets this appointment, she starts using her own name. That letter that she sent to the governor asking for the job was signed Mrs. Jesse Tenney. Mm -hmm. The second she's appointed state librarian, she becomes Mrs. H. A. Tenney, Mrs. Harriet Tenney. Yeah. Well, and we just have a photo up right now where her desk was. Now she served in three different buildings: the second, <laughs> the second capital, yes. a temporary state office building. Yes. But I think one of one of our our favorite images that we have. And this is from the current state capitol is this shot which is showing her desk yes. and the view looking into the library itself mm -hmm. and i think something that was a really neat comment that, that bernie had made before because we had a, a, a display up a while ago related to harriet's um tenure as, as state librarian is that when you look closely to this picture you can almost feel like you're you're there yeah and you can hear the pencil sound of the pencils and the uh, movement of the carts, and that this is a seat that no other woman had ever sat in until this sort of point. I mean, Bernie, what actually you nobody sat in it before. Well, she obviously did. that's too. That too. <laughs> but <laughs> that too. But I mean, but you know, I mean, you're, you're just as passionate about Harriet Tenney as what Val. Oh, yeah. What what sort of feelings do you have on her when you think of her? I think that I, what I see in her is a, a passion for this institution and for the role it plays in state government mm -hmm. and in, you know, Michigan's history that still survives with our staff today. Yes. I mean, it's, you know, we, we completely and... geek out yes. about the Library of Michigan. Yes. You don't want to get us started some days yeah. about the Library of Michigan. And, and you know, to me, that started with her. I, I think Jesse did a very good job. And he, he certainly brought the library into something that people started seeing it as an entity, as an institution itself. Um, but I think that passion for the job mm -hmm. really came, it really started with Harriet. Yes. And you can see how and this becomes her career and her name becomes synonymous with the library. Mm -hmm. And you can also see how she is very intentionally growing the library in different directions. When you talk about exchanges with states, she was writing back and forth to other state librarians mm -hmm. and she did not have a problem, you know, borrowing a good idea every now and then. Mm -hmm. And thanks to her communication with folks in Wisconsin, she is able ultimately in 1873 to convince the legislature to create kind of a sister organization called the Michigan Pioneers Society. And that same year, the legislature makes it her duty to start collecting not only books, but artifacts mm -hmm. and Michigan history, because there's this sense that Michigan history is kind of slipping through our fingers. It's passing away before our eyes. And we thought of, of the generation that was aging as the pioneers, not because they were the first people to live in Michigan by any sense, but because these were the people who'd settled the state and who had been there for statehood and had kind of seen it through its infancy. And Harriet didn't believe the library should be just a collection of state documents or law documents. She thought that the library should also be home to Michigan history, and it should be the institution that was deliberately collecting it and stewarding it for the future. And so she works with the legislature. She was a very good lobbyist, although she probably wouldn't have liked the term, <laughs> um, to, to give her these responsibilities. The next year, the Pioneer Society will form in 1874, and that society working with the library will, you know, will take up the, the torch of the old Historical Society of Michigan that had been in Detroit and had kind of fallen to punt. Um, they will publish the Michigan Pioneer Collections, which I have a couple volumes here with me today. These are, um, there's, what, 40 of these? 40. These are bound collections of historical narratives, of county histories, of personal reminiscences. Um, these are a wonderful source that I still use. What I do know about the interiors of the first and second capitals comes largely from the pioneer collections. And people from all across Michigan contribute to them. So she 
turns the library into something that is actively collecting from across Michigan and really working with the historical community to try to gather up these pieces before they're lost. Mm -hmm. So to me, she uses the library for good in perhaps what were non-library ways at that time. Yeah, she, she was setting very much standards and procedures that I think we still very use, much very much use today. Yeah. And I would say that you know that was then instilled within many of her immediate successors. And Bernie, I think um, the, a good question that I think you'd be very apt at answering would be to, to talk a little bit about some of those immediate successors like Mary Spencer, Mary Frankhauser. How were they shepherding the library following Harriet's examples? through both the initiatives that she did, other ones that they came up with, what was sort of their impact um, as after Harriet's time as state librarian ended? Well, I think it's important to think about the fact that Harriet made the library relevant to all people in Michigan, not just to the state government that was using it most, um, but the way she built that collection opened it to the public and the public could come in and use the library if they came to to Lansing and the people that came after her kind of built on that idea of providing access to information and how do we get information into the hands of people who can't come to Lansing mm -hmm. and so um the next state librarian that I was going to talk about is Mary Spencer. Mary Spencer was hired in 1885 by Harriet. She served as the assistant state librarian for um, a number of years, and then she was appointed state librarian in 1893. And I read somewhere that the uh, legislature referred her, to her as the little librarian. I think she was quite petite. Um, well, that, that's her picture up right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, she's a little bit dwarfed by that. Yes. By that death. Yeah. Um, she ultimately worked at the library for 38 years. She held the position of state librarian until 1923. Um, and she she was able to do things that Harriet had not been able to. Harriet was very much interested in what was happening in the library world elsewhere, but she was never able to actually travel to um, conferences for the American Library Association so that she could meet other librarians and actually talk to them face to face, not just pen to paper. Uh, but um, Mary, she actually did travel. And she went to she went to the ALA meeting in 1893 in Chicago, which I believe also means that she went to the World's Fair, which if I could go back in time, that's my dream. Mm -hmm. um, and she may have brought back ideas that she heard from other states. And in particular, um, in New York, they had developed an idea called traveling libraries, and that was a collection of books that were boxed up and were shipped out to a, a location if there was a group or an institution that wanted to host one of these collections, all they had to do was send a letter and it would be boxed up and sent by train and it allowed some very remote areas of Michigan to actually get a sense of what library service might do for that yes. area, for that um, for that population. Yes. And she and it became wildly popular. I mean, we the 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 statistics associated with the Michigan traveling libraries far outpaced. New York's traveling library program. And it lasted until uh, into the 1940s, yeah. I think. And um, one, of, one of them even made it to Iowa. I think you and I have yeah. talked about that. <laughs> yeah. 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 She was with through the traveling libraries. She was able to also influence the legislature to adopt um, other ideas that 
it it added duties to the library. It didn't really change what the library did, but it added what later became known as extension services. So it was the library started um, reaching out to other libraries that had been established in the state, offering training and advice. Um, and they it began this kind of network of libraries and it it was then people began to be able to point to say to their local government well you know this village has a library and look what they did we could do that too and the um, state library was a big part of establishing that service well and it's interesting how we even see that in lansing because it takes lansing a while to get its own library so the state library kind of functions as our unofficial public library during Harry's time, you can see there are a few novels in the collection and things that the state doesn't really need, but the local populace is probably using. And then you can see actually Mary Spencer helps Lansing get a Carnegie grant. So if you're familiar with the old Carnegie Library in downtown Lansing, that is um, the result of Mary Spencer's work. And it is said that she helped possibly as many as a couple dozen communities in, in Michigan get Carnegie grants. And so she was not only helping them inspire the creation of libraries, but she was helping communities get the actual dollars to build their own. Mm -hmm. Well, fortunately, she didn't live forever. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> no. uh, passed away. She, it, it, it is interesting to note that she was 81 and she had been appointed to a four year term mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. So her ability to um, to stay within state government, regardless of administration changes, is also yeah. um, really fascinating. And one thing I will interject quickly and say, um, when we're talking about all of these library moves, we're talking about physically moving the libraries. And so Harriet had to pack up tens of thousands of books twice and move them. Mm -hmm. Mary then had to do it towards the end of her tenure mm -hmm. because she grows the collection to a point where the library no longer fit in the Capitol. Mm -hmm. The big West Wing space that was three stories tall that was supposed to serve us forever um, gets full <laughs> within about 40 years. And so eventually the library will leave the Capitol the law collection stays behind, mm -hmm. but the bulk of the collection under Mary's leadership mm -hmm. will go into the new state office building, later known as the Cass building, now known as the Elliot Larson building. Yep. So, and, and some of the reports indicate these women are literally packing the boxes and toting and reorganizing themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we have a picture of that. Our colleague Matt's going to throw up. So, as you can see, it's much different. <laughs> Um, and uh, the building is still there today. It's now known as the Elliot Larson Building. Um, and so Mary Spencer was only in there just a few years. Right, because the, the library actually moved to, or the, the general part of the library moved to the State Office Building in 1922. Yeah. So um, she actually passed away and her assistant state librarian passed away in 1923. And that is significant for the next state librarian that was appointed because the governor at the time thought that the functions of the library were basically pretty routine. They didn't require somebody who had any kind of education or experience with libraries. We would have begged to differ. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, and um, so he ended up uh, there was a woman named Mary uh, Frankenhauser, and she was appointed to finish Mary Spencer's term. So she was not appointed as state librarian kind of in her own right. It was she was just kind of filling in. And it, it was controversial at the time because by that time, the Michigan Library Association had been established and they were very vocal in their disappointment of picking a candidate that did not have any library experience. And especially when you're talking about an institution now that has kind of a dual scope, it's, it's a library in and of itself with a huge collection of information that needs to be managed. Um, but then there's also this aspect of extension of supporting and offering services to other libraries around the state. 
And um, so the Michigan Library Association was very disappointed with Mary um, Frankhauser's uh, appointment. However, they quickly reversed their opinion because whether Governor Grosbeck thought he was getting somebody who was going to be very compliant, that's not what he got <laughs> in Mary Frankhauser. Um, she was, I mean, she was not um, conflict oriented, but she she spoke her mind. If she had an idea, if she had a perspective on something, she just said it. And she, I think she was a very logical person. Um, I also think she was a good organizer and a good manager, not only of um, services and programmings, but also of people. And when she came in, that's when we start to see kind of the internal structure that we still see in the library today. Mm -hmm. Like she, she established divisions. So there was a law division, there was a general division, which was now in the state office building, and then there was an extension division. And so she set people up as not just working on whatever they had time to do during that day, but this is your focus. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that allowed her then to really push the library into taking on more and more and more extension services. She didn't stop at public libraries. She actually um, extended um, the support services to schools and colleges and then to state prisons, which was a somewhat novel idea in the 1920s. And um, that's also when we start to see, uh, see mentioned that she created a genealogy department, which is such a big part of the state library's collections and services today. And it's not that people maybe didn't use the library's collections for that, but I mean, she said, you know, we need to focus on this. We need to put and some she, boundaries in that. the value of the individual stories of Michigan people. Yeah, yeah, exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. And, um, she was there when the library actually passed its 100th anniversary, and she was part of um, part of that. Um, and she was able to be reappointed until 1933, when you know she came in under a cloud of criticism, not directed at her necessarily, but at her appointment. And then she left under a similar cloud of um, criticism because she was replaced uh, summarily by a the new governor's pick. And it was simply political patronage. He was simply paying a, a bad favor. Mm -hmm. And that's something it's easy for us to lose sight of today because there's an expectation in state government of, of being nonpartisan in many pieces of it. And we we get to these jobs because we have certain credentials and experience and so on. But so much of state government at this point in time is just all about who you know and who you are tied to politically and what favor they might owe you. The first real inklings of civil service are not going to come in until the late 1930s. So there starts to be pushback around this time mm -hmm. because there was such a, a rapid fluctuation back and forth. Remember, everybody's up for re-election every two years. So with power shifts, you throw all the bums out and you clean house and you bring new in. That can happen every two years. Mm -hmm. And that eventually starts to kind of take a toll on the experience and the institutional knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to think about how much of that conversation in the 30s was bubbling up because of situations like what happened mm -hmm. at the state library. Well, and we're also getting into a point where the Great Depression is hitting. Yes. And there's also that, I, I think you've said this before to me, Val, that like a governor may be there for two years and then he gets voted out. Right. And I, I think that had just as much of an impact on it did. state librarian. We were struggling so much as a society, and I think we lose this sometimes because this is when FDR is president, and he seems like he's president forever <laughs> because this is pre-term limit, so he's there for, he's elected four times. But in state government, there is just a sense that nobody really knows how to grapple with this kind of issue. It is the biggest challenge the state has ever faced, and so we're just turning back and forth and back and forth going, who has the solution? Who has the solution? Who has the solution? At the same time, we have to remember too, Michigan had it worse than most of the country. 
When we talk about a quarter of the population being unemployed nationally in Michigan, sometimes it was a third or even more than a third because we are a very manufacturing driven state by this point in time. And quite frankly, if people cannot afford cars, if people cannot afford furniture, if they can't afford what we're making, there's no employment for the people who made it. And so Michigan is impacted worse than many other places in the depression. And that has an effect on the state budget. That has an effect on department leaders. And the library is one of the institutions that suffers cuts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mary Frankhauser was, um, by 1933, she was commenting on the cuts that were continuously coming. And it, they were coming across state government. And she said she was not objecting to cuts within the library. It's just that she didn't think the library should have to be cut more right. than mm -hmm. anyone else. And um, so she eventually, she, the new governor came in and he asked for her res her resignation so that he could put a new person in her place. And I find it kind of interesting. And I'd like to talk to Mary because <laughs> she, in the first paragraph of her resignation letter, she responds to the fact that she had not responded to the initial request for that resignation. And then she got a second, somebody approached her and saying, we really need you to submit this letter of resignation. And she finally did do it. But that first paragraph is the reason she did not submit that resignation is because she did not believe the governor had the authority to ask for it. So I think, I think that her survival in state government is amazing just like Harriet's just like Mary Spencer's was and and she clearly stood on the shoulders of those two women that came before her and made the library again even more than it was by the time she left in only 10 years and, and her never from what we know probably never having had conversations with either of them I mean like, no it's certainly possible not, but don't no, yeah. highly unlikely like, like, yeah, yeah 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 um so we certainly see with the depression and, 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 and you know several state librarians coming and going during this time. But I think the next one who really certainly kind of builds on those other ones uh, of their experiences is certainly really Defiant. Mm -hmm. And so she built on those experiences, but also um, had to deal with a devastating state office building fire. Um, Matt's going to show a picture that shows when we had to bring all the books over to the state vocational school field house to dry them out in 1951. Um, short story of this, uh, M. Dot employee who was 19 years old and wanted to avoid being drafted into Korea, set a fire at the top of the state office building. We lost 30 to 35,000 items, possibly more. And so this is when somebody like Lolita is having to deal with this sort of devastating experience while also trying to do so much more. Um, Bernie, can you kind of talk a little bit more about her experiences, you know, what the library did um, during her time while also dealing with this devastating event? Yeah. Um, so Lolita's appointment is um, significant because after um, Mary Frankhauser's um, unappointment, uh, <laughs> the Michigan Library Association really started to push the legislature that the state librarian's job had to be based on merit and on education, not on just somebody who wanted to be state librarian. And so they were able to get the legislature to pass legislation that um, the requirement for a state librarian came to be that it had it had to be a person who had a degree in library science, and they had to have four years of experience in a library before they could take that position. And um, Lolita Fion is the first woman that was a uh, first state librarian that was hired under that new legislation. And um, 
So, you know, it was, you know, she was a professional librarian and that was really touted. Um, and she was, uh, she was president of the American Library Association in 1951. And so she was nationally a recognized figure within the library world. Um, <laughs> and then the fire happened in February of 51. And what they soon realized is the legislature was completely out of touch as to the scope of the library services and the needs that, you know, what kind of an environment or, um, uh, you know, a, a building that they needed to take care of all of those um, services. And it there wasn't money to completely retrofit a new building at that time or just build a new building. And that would have taken years anyway. So the library's operations were kind of broken up into multiple locations around Lansing. Um, and, but it is to me interesting to note that the claim from the library, from Lolita Fion, was that by February of the next year, they were completely up and running. Their services were completely restored. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that, again, she was building on from Mary Spencer, from Mary Frankhauser, was the extension services. So the services to other libraries. And at that point, the library was loaning hundreds of thousands of books every year to other libraries to help support their collections mm -hmm. or to use for what they called demonstration projects, which was when they would fill a bookmobile full of books and they would take it to a county fair mm -hmm. or um, they would park it in a, you know, a town square or a downtown area of a little town that didn't have libraries and give people an idea of what they could have if they had their own library, if they established their own library. And um, so she was there when the legislature actually established some legislation that allowed for the extension of library services to rural areas. And that was, uh, there's a photograph in a newspaper of her and, uh, somebody, some other official, and they have superimposed her like walking up a pile of books <laughs> and talking about how she has extended library service to over a million people in in Michigan. And of course, a million means a lot more then than it does today. But <laughs> it was it was very significant. Um, but it's you know it's again it's that there's kind of a um, when you think about it, the library has kind of two faces. We have the what we call the brick and mortar face, which is where we serve patrons who come to us, um, whether they come in person or now they come by phone or by email and um, provide them with the benefit of our collection, these really rich, deep collections. But then there's also uh, what is now called statewide development and um, that is a whole other aspect of the library that works with other libraries around the state and um, helps them deal with library legal issues and um, advocates for funding for libraries. And so Lolita is where you really start to see that, um, that real separation, those two faces of the library that now exist and also the establishment of the escanaba up branch mm -hmm. so that you're at least getting more physical items into these rural places that don't necessarily have the same infrastructure like what they do down here in the lower peninsula yeah so yeah these librarians they got around yeah now mary spencer and mary frank hauser traveled by train all over the state. Mary Frankhauser went to the UP at least once every year, sometimes twice. Wow. And in the 1920s, I don't think traveling to the UP was quite as comfortable as it might be today. So <laughs> rich. <laughs> right, you know, and, but she, that was that kind of commitment yes. is that we want good library service. We want books in everybody's hands, yeah. you know, and that's really what they were. Yeah. Now, the hope is to eventually get into a more permanent home 
Um, by 1988, that, that did happen. Um, but there was other circumstances kind of leading up to that that led to um, our current location at the Michigan Library and Historical Center. Um, Matt has a picture right now of a previous building to that. Can you talk a little bit about yeah. <laughs> what that what state library so, was? <laughs> um, when the uh, 1963 Constitution was passed, the library had been moved into the new Department of Education at that time. And those those two missions were seen as um, having a lot to do with each other and that the State Library could support that new department. Um, however, it, it kind of got lost in that department. And the department, when it needed to, it would siphon resources. It would uh, use people that worked at the library to support programs that they were um, uh, trying to get off the ground. And then they also started using some of the library's appropriations uh, or their their segment of the Department of Education's mm -hmm. appropriation. And so the legislature started to get quite upset about this because they felt like the library could no longer offer the services that they need. Mm -hmm. And we have to remember, this was way before the internet, way before Google, where you can look up just about any information that you need at your fingertips. When these legislators needed information on um, to pass laws, to, to draft laws, they came to the library for that information. We were that source. And so the there was a Senator Faust who was a proponent of library service. He was also a proponent of um, renovating the Capitol, I yes. find out today. Yes. Mm -hmm. And all around good guy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and um, he, and then, so the legislature began making plans to bring the library back under the legislature, the office of the legislature. And um, a part of that then was also building a building that would house, that was dedicated to the library and then the state museum. And it was, so it was this, the Michigan Library and Historical Center. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where we are today. And we're grateful to yep. have that space that um, is dedicated to that. Although we are still is getting, um, we're still having the problems of space management. Yeah. That, that, um, I think that, that Aaron yes. and Mary and Mary yes. and everybody that came after her had. That, so. That's a, a legacy. I think we will we will just always have to yeah. soldier on to try and do what we can for. Um, it's the nature of a collecting institution. It, it is. <laughs> and, 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 um, but you know, we, we still are grateful for the building that we're in. Um, for anybody who does come, we are in the West Wing of the Michigan Library Historical Center. And as Bernie said, that the East Side is where the State Archives and the, and the State Museum is. Um, and this then comes into sort of that, that question about like, uh, throughout our history, you know, the collections have been that foundation of the institution. and. Um, I'm going to kind of throw this at Val because you're, as as more of a patron than a staff member, I think you can give a unique perspective on it, especially as somebody who does so much research. You know, how, how do you see how they have evolved or meeting the needs of stakeholders like yourself? Um, do you have a particular favorite item? It's like picking your favorite I don't know. There's so many things. Out of that a million I'm plus children. <laughs> <children. laughs> My favorite child, yeah. <laughs> child person, but um, I am here a lot. There's a couple of us who joke that we may be your most frequent patrons. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's so many things at the library. I use the state documents a lot, as I said earlier, to try to understand state government mm -hmm. and decisions that are being made about capital, but also what's going on in the building. You know, who is who is in charge and what is motivating their actions at various points in time in state history. Mm -hmm. um, I do a lot of newspaper research. Um, I firmly believe that if you have enough hours of microfilm, you can learn almost anything. <laughs> and the great thing for me is because Lansing 
has often seen the Capitol as kind of its center, if you will. There's always lots of Capitol gossip in the Lansing papers, and some of it filters to other places in the state. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of hours in the microfilm room. Um, I use the Pioneer collections. Um, there are many things in there written by early legislators. Like I said, there are there's capital content in those, and I'm often digging through the collection to learn not only about the capital building itself, but also other things tied to it. Mm -hmm. So right now I'm working on an exhibit that will open at a to be determined date about a decorative painting company, a decorative interior firm in Detroit. Mm -hmm. So I've been over here looking through Detroit resources to get a better sense of what is Detroit like at that time? What is the German community like in Detroit? Uh, do we have still some German language state documents from the 19th century, mm -hmm. which were printed for the German immigrants? Mm -hmm. um, and also trying to understand better, um, you know, what was, what were Harriet, what were Mary thinking as they pulled things in? Mm -hmm. It's amazing what you can just find on the shelves. I mean, one day I was down in the, no, I was upstairs in the general reference collection, looking for things about German history. Mm -hmm. And I found two basically travel log books from the 1850s <laughs> that were on your shelves. That was this very brave American woman who just picks up and decides she's gonna go walk around Germany and she's gonna write about her experience. That book may have been acquired in the 1850s, mm -hmm. that can predate the 10s. Mm -hmm. And it's still sitting on your shelves. Yeah. And that's amazing. Money to be moved to rare. <laughs> I, I already had that discussion with my okay. colleagues. <laughs> um, but it's so interesting to see, you know, what what people have prioritized. Yeah. And when you talk about collection development, I don't think Harriet had those words, but she had that concept. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I think it's really interesting to see the fact that she is collecting a a document um, of a bound history of individually written longhand history of the different women's Christian temperance union chapters yeah. in the state, the WCTUs. Yeah. This is women literally writing their own histories, putting them all together in a nice red leather binding, and they gave it to her. And still in the front of it is an inscription, you know, donated by the WCTU ladies, given to the care of Mrs. Harriet Tenney, state librarian. I think there's a little statement about, you know, if we ever want it back. Mm -hmm. But it's <laughs> She understood the value of bringing that in the collection when the WCTU was still a very new thing. Mm -hmm. When women in general were not writing history, but she's collecting contemporaneously mm -hmm. with what's going on because she understands that in 50 years, 100 years, 150 years, people are going to want that information. Mm -hmm. And just the foresight is what amazes me. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, yeah. One of the best parts of our collection is that a lot of researchers might come in thinking that they want like facts and figures. Yeah. It, okay, those numbers may be there, but I think what they really want <laughs> is um, that um, the connection with what was going on around those facts and figures, what contributed to, you know, somebody's appointment, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so, so context is really what you can get in our collection, because it does, it is so broad, and it is so deep yeah. in, in Michigan information. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and even just going beyond that of not just the facts, but we're also getting the imagination mm -hmm. of Michigan authors that we've now made it such a greater point to have those fiction books mm -hmm. by Michigan authors or where books are set in Michigan using the Michigan Notable Books Program mm -hmm. as a greater catalyst for collecting all that, that we're not just getting the stories, but that wonderful inspiration that led to mm -hmm. these other sorts of you know titles that people can look at and say like i've been there i've been to sarcatuck dunes and there was a book that was taking place there or monroe michigan or sault saint marie or something like that well and in the rare collection you had some scrapbooks 
So yeah. there's also, you know, there's a curatorial aspect to that. Maybe the person who is putting the scrapbook together doesn't consider themselves a writer per se, but they are telling a story through what they're collecting, through pictures mm -hmm. and through documents. And I, I love, you know, you have a, a suffrage scrapbook from the 1870s. Yeah. You have a scrapbook of materials related to Evan McCall Hamilton, the first woman to serve in the state legislature. Mm -hmm. And those may not be traditional, you know, nonfiction tomes that people expect to find on the library shelves, but yeah. they tell such interesting stories. Yeah. Well, and then those are the types of things that kind of help us continue that kind of connection that we've had with the Capitol, mm -hmm. even though we are no longer there. Um, you know, we, we certainly have that that legacy. And I think one thing that is going on in Heritage Hall is also maintaining that legacy. Matt's going to put up, put up a picture that you can probably explain a little bit of. So the, the sort of short version of a very long story is the law library stays in the Capitol after the main collection moves out in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. Law library stays until 1970 when it leaves, when the Supreme Court leaves the building. And the last vestiges of Harriet's beautiful library full of over 100 walnut bookcases is gutted out. Mm -hmm. Happily, some of that wood is sent to a state warehouse where it sits for about the next 10 years. And before it can be hauled off to the dump, a local woodworker gets his hands on some of it and takes it home because he sees the value is this is old growth walnut. This is you know stuff you cannot find no matter how much money you have. Mm -hmm. Well, he uses some of it, but he has so much. He eventually gets to the point where he starts to look for another home for it. Mm -hmm. And miracle of miracles, a couple of years ago, I was able to start talking to him and he has donated back to our collection at the Capitol pieces of that library wood, mm -hmm. which we then took to the Senate carpentry team and said, what can you do with this? <laughs> do you think this could be a puzzle? Um, and they said, yeah, you've got pictures, right? So using some of those pictures, like the one with Harriet's desk yeah. that we looked at a few slides ago, they were able to recreate one of the old bookcases. Mm -hmm. Now it's only about half as deep as it would have been mm -hmm. because this is not, <laughs> this is going in a smaller room, yes. frankly. Yeah. But what you see here on the screen is an in-progress image of one of those rebuilt bookcases mm -hmm. using a fair bit of the wood from the books from the bookcases that Harriet and Mary um, Spencer and Mary Frankenhauser to some extent when she came mm -hmm. over to check on the law collection, mm -hmm. you know, those were their bookcases. Yes. And I am happy to tell you that this is now finished. And next Thursday, so one week from today, we will actually, we, I say this, I will be watching the <laughs> burly guys carry this in pieces into my building and yeah. reassemble it. It will not be instantly available for the people to see. We have to build an exhibit around it still, mm -hmm. but um, we are so excited because the State Library is something we talk about. You know, we have a couple pictures in Heritage Hall. We yeah. have a table. We have a picture of Harriet because, mm -hmm. of course, yes. we curated the exhibit, so Harriet's going to be there. Yeah. But um, we are so excited to be able to bring this bookcase back yeah. and help people better understand the library's history in the building, yeah. but also to think about the Capitol as kind of a crossroads of information. Mm -hmm. um, it's still where we we make the laws that end up being printed and going on your shelves. Yes. <laughs> it is still where the yes. policy is created that affects the library and the rest of state government and the rest of us as Michiganders. Mm -hmm. um, so to me, it's just a, a beautiful symbol of that rich history of the library and information and the seat of government all coming together. Yeah, and there, there's so much that, 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 that ties around between the Capitol and us here at, and, and our current location. Um, I wish we could talk about more because we could probably spend more hours going into you know all those things that were going on post the construction of the building, um, you know, being part of history arts and libraries, um, more into our state today, whether it's with more statewide services or um, Michigan e-library, all of that. But kind of as a sort of final couple sentences, what would you both look at with just the legacy of the library today and how you see us continue going forward. Oh, well, that's not a big question, Adam. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he said it's well, been doing it in a tweet. <laughs> I will just say that to me, that link is very special because at the heart of state government, 
is words and it's information mm -hmm. and it's it's the policy that is created. It's the laws that are written and tweaked and amended and struck off the books. That is that forms our society in Michigan. And those are the laws that we all live our lives by. We're affected by them. Um, and you can't have those, those laws without two things. You can't have those laws without a central repository of information mm -hmm. for them to live at and to be perpetuated by because they need to continue to exist. It is literally your legal responsibility to make sure that mm -hmm. these things survive. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you also can't have those things you can't have those conversations to make those things without a seat of government. Mm -hmm. And that's the Capitol building. That's still the place where people come together to discuss and argue over and hash out the policy. Mm -hmm. So we create the policy in our building, but you preserve that policy in perpetuity. Mm -hmm. So to me, we are we are just intrinsically linked. That synergy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. final? <laughs> um, you know, for me, it's all about, as I said before, it's all about the people, yeah. you know, and, you know, those early state librarians, they kind of was a little bit more, of, oh, that's a good job, you know, <laughs> um, and, but eventually people did catch fire with the idea of how valuable that information is yeah. that you were talking about and that preserving it is more than just putting it on shelves or having enough space for it. It's, you know, it's knowing that it's that there. It's stewardship. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, it's that, that that is still here and we are still helping the people in the Capitol in the same way mm -hmm. that we were almost 200 years ago. Yeah. That's, that's just really exciting. It will be 195. Yeah. yeah. So um, I know we've gone a little bit longer than uh, an hour. Um, we're just hitting 741. So uh, we've got time for some questions. If there's, uh, Matt, if you want to read off, if there was any that were in the, the comments, what do, you, what do you have? First question, is the picture on the wall about Harriet of Jesse? No, we do not know what that picture is of, actually. Um, that image was taken in a photographic studio, so it's likely it was just a stock, something or other hanging on the wall. Yeah. But there's never been any indication that that was Jesse. But it's our favorite picture of Harriet. Oh, it is our yeah. favorite picture yes. of Harriet. <laughs> Bernie and I are both desperate to know everyone's theories on what color her dress is in it. Yeah. So yeah. feel free to share yours. Yes. <laughs> This is a question. What role, if any, did the library play in the establishment of the Ladies' Library Associations in Michigan? Well, those groups were, um, it, it was actually a little bit more about those groups and the role they played in getting local libraries established. Mm -hmm. Um, Mary Frankhauser, she, in one of her um, speeches or papers that she wrote, she encouraged women's groups to really get behind the idea of local libraries. And, and in many places, that's where local libraries started, is because of the, the local women's group. So um, it wasn't, you know, those groups didn't come out of the state library necessarily, but definitely their roles kind of had the same goals. And there's an awareness between the two very early on. So one of the items that comes into the collection, I think during Harriet's early years, is actually the dedication of a ladies library association building in Flint that a governor spoke at. And Harriet thought, okay, this is Michigan history being made. This is a governor speaking. This is a library being created. This belongs in the collection. Mm -hmm. And you can see where during Harriet's time, Mary Spencer's time, Mary Frank Hauser's time, they are doing what they can to support these entities, some of which have now grown into local libraries already. Mm -hmm. So there's a there's a kind of synergy there. Mm -hmm. And also the women's clubs that were the literary clubs that were often connected to these the literary um, to these library associations, they are also drawing some of those um, lending libraries and they are 
in some cases, you know, making Harriet and, and Mary Spencer honorary members, even though they're yeah. counties away. Yes. And they are talking in some of their reports about helping serve these women as they are learning and as they are seeking to spread learning in their communities, wherever that is. It's neat to see some of the state librarians as local as celebrities. Yeah, yes. yes. In a sense. I were. I know, they they absolutely were. They were. You know, they, 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 it's not just a position, but it's something of of more than more than just stature. It's something yeah. that 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 people can like, oh my goodness, it's Harry and Teddy. Yeah. <laughs> Even today, if yeah. we go to visit a library and the state librarian has visited that library, yeah. that's one of the first things they say. Oh, the state librarian was here just last month. Yeah. You know, it's still. <laughs> yeah. I, I had that when I stopped in Palmer just a few weeks ago. And one of the first things that the li uh, library director there said is, oh, Randy Riley was recently here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else you got that? Another question? Um, what was the punishment for the person who started the fire? Oh, yeah. He, um, unfortunately for him, he thought arson was a misdemeanor, but it was a felony. So he actually was convicted and he did serve um, some prison time. I, I don't know exactly how long, yeah. but he. the reason that he did that is that he had a young son at home and he did not want he was afraid he was going to be drafted and be taken away from his family so he thought if he committed a misdemeanor it would make him ineligible for the draft and you know but it, it was he should have consulted the law library yes. <laughs> well not only does a significant part of the collection get destroyed books that you still have were damaged mm -hmm. yeah. and we lost the floor of that building. Yes. Yeah, it just happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we lost things that couldn't be replaced. Yeah, yeah. Too. there were no copies. Yeah. yeah. Last question on chat. Did you ever try colorizing the floral area? <laughs> <laughs> um, there have been attempts at colorizing some of the other photos of her. I don't know if I've seen that one. No. Um, it would be an interesting exercise. Yeah. Um, you know, we so often think of the 19th century as just being this black and white time. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very easy for us to lose the sense that color was everywhere then as well. Mm -hmm. And I often wonder actually, not only what color Harry's dress was, but those images of the library interior itself. Yeah. I mean, you had brown bookcases. We know that. We know the ceiling pattern for the decorative art was kind of a mosaic with a gold scroll that goes through it. We've recreated that, so we know what that looks like. Yeah. We know they had linoleum floor. Yeah. Not sure the color on that, but what did it look like with yeah. all of the signs of those books? Yeah. I mean, you think the Manchester Manuals have been read forever. Yeah. So you had yeah. those red blotches. You yeah. had blue sections. You had green sections. You had tan bindings. Mm -hmm. It must have been an absolute rainbow of color though to yeah. walk into that space yeah and to see all of that or or even the sound of her voice yes or some of the other staffs <laughs> or the sound of the tourists who like to come in the library on their capital tours yes and you can see a few months into the building's opening in, in 1879 she's writing a letter to a friend in detroit and she's like I cannot hear myself think because there's just an unending stream of people coming in to tour the building. I can't get anything done. <laughs> and if you've ever been in the Capitol, you know how that is because yeah. it's still that way to this yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think that legacy has lived on because our stairwell downstairs has a very high yes. level. Right. Yes. <laughs> um, be careful what you say from one floor to the back. Yeah. Too. Well, if there aren't any questions in the chat, we do encourage anybody if they want to unmute themselves and ask any questions, we should be able to hear you um, if, you if, uh, if you do so. Make sure that the volume's up on the computer. Anybody? I have a question. Ah, Marge, what do you have? It's Marge, Adam. How are you? Pretty good. <laughs> good. Uh, for the lady in the center with the state about the state papers, yeah. I've been trying. 
are, do they pertain just to the state top government or does it include local governments? I've been trying to find, uh, I guess what we would call township minutes for Hayes Township up in Charlevoix County from like about 1880 to 1887. Uh, they have nothing up there and they don't know if they exist. And if they did, they don't know where they're at. Yeah, that, that's gonna be a challenging question. It, it is possible that we have material here. We do collect from local governments, but it hasn't been, um, it's not as complete a collection as our state documents collection. Um, the, it is possible that the, um, local the minutes that were generated there have been transferred to the state archives because the state archives takes in local government records um however that time period you know you're running up against um floods fires people cleaning out closets and basements and not understanding what they're throwing away so Unfortunately, there may not be something, but if you want to send us, uh, give us a call and we're happy to see what we can find. Well, Marge is one of our, our, our frequent patrons. And I hope so, you'll be uh, getting an email. <laughs> <laughs> we, we love when you email us. <laughs> I will I will try and write something up what I'm looking for and if you could help or yeah. if you can forward it on to the lady that would be wonderful no yeah thank you other questions yep hi this is uh pam triplet i was wondering i know you're recording this is it going to be made available for other people to watch like i'd like to have some of our people in my library be able to watch this yes so right now the feed that is going on facebook should automatically archive and be available sometime within like an hour or two after we end the session. And then what we're gonna have to do with the, um, the Zoom recording itself is we will get that captioned and then made available on um, our YouTube channel that we share with the rest of the Michigan Department of Education. That normally takes about a week or two, but no matter what, there will be two places that you'll be able to find a recording. One on our Facebook page, and then in the next week or two on YouTube through the Michigan Department of Education page. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Any others? Any others in the chat, Matt? Okay, well, then I think we will just wrap things up here from the rare book reading room of the Library of Michigan. And thank you to everybody for participating and uh, look for our next program that will be in the first week of uh, July. I believe that's on using state and local documents for family history research. And then also make sure to check out what good things our friends at the Capitol are doing. We will be starting our June programs next week for our June Rise in Progress, we will be offering both a virtual and an in-person tour of our grounds, where we will be talking about flower beds and lampposts and sidewalks and basically the evolution of Capitol Square over time. So if you enjoy walking past and seeing the 10,000 beautiful flowers we planted about a week ago, um, come and learn the history of why they're there and how our, our square has evolved over time. And any last comments? No, nope. we just we welcome all all comers. We are happy to do tours. If you want to give us a call um, or send us an email, we're happy to set up something like that, and we can talk even more about the state library. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and on that note, I think we'll call it good night. Thank you, everybody. Um, look for more information about the Library of Michigan at michigan.gov slash Library of Michigan. Good night, and we'll see you hopefully soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.